Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, Bonsolo Expert Witness video. I'm delighted to have uh, Barrister Nick Deal with us, who is our senior trainer with the Expert Witness Group. We're going to look at particularly the goods and bads of discussions between experts and the joint uh, statement that's produced at the end of that statement. Um, these discussions are the best of times and the worst of times. If they're done well, they're fantastic. And if they're done badly, there's real problems. So Nick, can you just explain to us very quickly what is a discussion between experts? Yeah, it's it's typically ordered by the judge in the case. And um, sometime before the actual hearing date, the judge orders that the experts from like disciplines get together for a discussion that can be done virtually, and certainly is, is done virtually nowadays, to discuss the expert issues in the case and identify the areas that they agree on and identify also the areas that they disagree on and give brief reasons for their disagreements. And the aim is to, to narrow the issues down for the judge so the judge has a more focused, simpler time at the hearing. So that's it in a nutshell. Well, of course, by definition, it's a discussion between the experts, not a discussion between the solicitors or the clients. And so it's up to the experts to um, prepare for that meeting and also to minute that meeting. What can you say about the importance of the minuting of that and what's that called in legal jargon? Well, in, in, in terms of experts recording, I mean, the, the, the only part of the output of the, of the discussion that gets brought in front of the court is the joint statement. Right. So this joint statement sets out what they agree on and what they disagree on with their brief reasons for disagreement. The judge doesn't want a whole re-rehearsal of, of all of their views, but just a, a brief outline. So that's the joint statement. In, in terms of keeping notes of the discussion, of course, the experts are free to, to do that in any way that they want to. But those notes of the, of the content of the discussion are not shared with the court unless the court orders it or unless the parties agree to it. But the thing that gets shared is, and the, and the crucial factor in all of this, is this joint statement, which the, the courts um, actually place a, quite a huge amount of reliance on. So, so just to be clear for, for our experts, the, there's a distinction between the minutes of a meeting or notes of a meeting that you would take, and secondly, the, 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 in fact, the public domain element, which is the statement and that's a summary uh, of their areas around the issues that you've discussed. Now, clearly, that's going to be a very important uh, document. Now, who prepares that? Do they choose between the two of them? Do they both do it? And when do they sign it? Right. Well, this, this is where we get into some potentially difficult territory. Uh, it sounds like most of the time this works well. But as you say, it can be a, a really bad time as well. So the the rules all anticipate that the experts themselves, in the course of their discussion, draw up the joint statement. Sure. Uh, and the aim is that they sign it uh, there and then, um, or very soon thereafter, and having signed it, they then send it out to the parties instructing them. That's what the rules all describe. Um, but there is flexibility. So there is, is, depending on the nature and complexity of the case and the number of issues involved and so on, a, a discussion could take days or weeks. And I, I've heard of discussions taking even months because there are so many issues to deal with. So it's plainly not going to be viable to nail everything down in the course of that discussion. So it is open to the experts to ping each other emails just to build that joint statement. And of course, this is where the difficulties creep in, because the more time you allow to elapse, the more potential there is for the other side, as it were, to, to, to rethink her, her or his position um, and come back and, and actually change uh, from what you had thought was an agreed position into disagreement and then sort of residing back to their original place. That's an interesting point, Nick, because uh, as we all know, the duty of the expert is, of course, to the court, not to the paying party. Um, now, we've done surveys over the years at Bonsolo, and, and many experts have said there has been pressure put on them by the instructing party, uh, instructing solicitors, to perhaps improve the opinion. Does that happen around 
these discussions, can the lawyers actually influence what is discussed in those uh, discussions and the outcome in the eventual joint statement? Uh, yes, they can, and they're not allowed to. And then there are a couple of things to, to say about this. The, the rules are crystal clear that the lawyers are not allowed uh, just to backtrack, there needs to be an agenda for this discussion so that the experts know what they're talking about. And the lawyers are allowed to have an input into that. That's absolutely fine. But they're not allowed to tell the expert not to discuss certain areas or not to reach agreement on certain areas. So there's a very clear, specific uh, 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 injunction, really, in the, in the uh, guidance for instruction of experts not to do that and for experts not to accept those sorts of instructions. But also the, the, the solicitors can uh, bring influence to bear in other ways. So they can be briefing their experts. Well, look, you know, go and discuss it, but, you know, obviously we'll need to see the draft joint statement first. And again, the, the rules are clear about this. The expert doesn't need anybody's authorization to sign their statement. And the running order is, you have your discussion, you draft your joint statement, you sign it, and then you send it to your solicitors. There's been a couple of cases recently where um, a very experienced expert witness was criticized um, in a case back in 2018 for having sent a draft of the joint statement to his solicitors. Right. Uh, and the judge described it in the case as a serious transgression, uh, that there is no no area of the law allows the uh, instructing solicitors to have any input into the construction or drafting of the joint statement. The only exception to that is in the Technology and Construction Court, where the solicitors can be sent a draft statement, but only so that they can review it to ensure that all the issues have been dealt with. So it's, it's just making sure it's there for completeness, but they can't influence what the experts write. And the judges take this actually very, very seriously. Nobody is allowed to have any, any say in this at all. Um, it was it was sorry just it was extended also in another case in 2018 where yeah can I just interrupt yeah sorry because um, some of our experts have reported to us and no doubt to you that uh, they come across the other expert who is very intransigent they're not moving and clearly they may well have been in that comes briefed by the instructing solicitor what should they do if they come across the intransigent intransigent expert or one that doesn't really want to sign a joint statement? I think there are a couple of things that, that you can do. Um, I think the first thing is in your own preparation, be really clear what is the purpose of this discussion. So we're here to help the court. This is all part of the overriding duty to help the court. And it's not going to help the court if we just disagree for the sake of disagreeing. If we if we disagree for good reason, that's absolutely fine. Um, but so this, this intransigent behaviour is not going to help the court. If an expert has come up against that, I think they can challenge that directly with their uh, opposite number, remind them of the rules, remind them what they're here to do. If it continues, then we get as far as drafting the joint statement and the other expert is, is saying, well, I, the examples I've had are, are experts saying, well, I'm not going to um, give my reasons or uh, my reasoning hasn't changed my report or I'm right and you're wrong and that's the end of the discussion. If that's what they're getting, then I think the expert can um, say, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll drop the, 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 the joint statement and you can do it as a sort of table format. And so have the issue, have your opinion with brief reasons and then leave the other column blank for the other expert to fill in. What will emerge from that to the judge is a clear indication that one expert is is simply sticking with their original report without any real attempt to engage in the discussion. Sure. The other thing the expert can do, I think, is just to keep a record of what happened because there's nothing to stop you talking to your instructing solicitors about the, the way that the other expert behaved during the course of the discussion. Difficult to see what use can be made of that, but at least it's it's sharing the knowledge of what's occurred and the experts shouldn't then feel that they're completely on their own 
um, in the course of that discussion. Okay. So, Sorry, I interrupted you a moment ago. Um, are there any recent cases where there has been improper conduct um, around meetings? Yeah, there was there was one which I was referring to just a moment uh, before, which was where um, an expert was criticised for having gone into a discussion, prepared with their opposite number a joint statement. And then because this expert was actually in the course of their own profession in, in, the, in supervision, uh, they then shared the contents of that with their supervisor. And the judge said, no, none of this should be shared outside. It is just you and the other expert. The other, um, perhaps more, well, certainly more serious one was a case back in 2019, uh, which we heard about at our expert witness conference in 2019, I think it was. Um, it was the Crown against Sully and the case uh, of the expert, Mr. Andrew Ager, um, who put himself forward as a carbon credits trading expert in a, in a uh, criminal prosecution. Um, engaged by the prosecuting authorities. And in this particular case, the defence instructed, instructed an expert witness as well, and there was a joint discussion between them. In the course of which the, Mr. Ager told the defence expert um, that his reputation would be destroyed if he came to the English courts to give evidence. Uh, this, the defence expert was an Italian uh, academic um, and the, Mr. Ager also told him that a number of prosecution uh, witnesses or a number of investors in the scheme that was alleged to be fraudulent had committed suicide because their investments had disappeared. That was a complete lie. None of that had happened at all. And what the judge found was that Mr. Ager was deliberately trying to put the defence expert off coming to court. How this all came to light and I'm certainly not recommending this as a, as a way forward, but how this came to light was that uh, Dr. Funza, the, the defence instructed expert, didn't just take notes of the meeting. He actually recorded it without telling Mr. Ager. Now, I think we need to be absolutely clear. I'm not recommending that as a course of action at all, ever, under any circumstances. But he recorded the meeting, recorded what Mr. Ager said, that was then sent through to his barristers who used that to cross-examine Ager to, to demonstrate that he wasn't an appropriate um, expert witness. That's a fairly extreme example of, of poor behaviour. Just, Nick, just remind us the name of that case in case people... It's, it's the Crown Against Sully, S-U-L-L-Y, and it's 2019. Well, Nick, it sounds, as we said in our opening remarks, it's the best of times and the worst of times. And... Experts obviously are aware of the necessity to be able to be cross-examined or write a decent report on all the basics of law and procedure, but it sounds like experts' discussions require a new skill set. And I think you lead a programme specifically on this quite dangerous area, as it were. Can you just tell us what's in that programme and why it's important people take it? Yeah, sure. So so we've been running this for, for, for quite a while, and it's what, what's been really helpful for experts on the program is to understand um, perhaps more of the nuts and bolts of the discussion, really to get to grips with what the courts want, uh, what the rules expect, um, and also to think about how to deal with those intransigent, difficult experts and how to head off some of the problems before they become really difficult. Um, so we go through all the phases of the experts discussion right the way from uh, the judge ordering it to who uh, puts together the agenda to how to prepare for it, which is critical, how to conduct it, um, what can go wrong during it, how to put together the joint statement, what the judges are looking for in that, um, and what the dangers are in all of that. So what it what it equips the expert witness with is a, a real understanding of what the what the good and the bad of going into this discussion could be. I think the issue for for most experts is that uh, most of the time this will work fine, but when it goes wrong, it can go horribly wrong, and you don't necessarily know what's going to cause it to go wrong. And and from from experience. Two things really come out. Firstly, that things go wrong primarily because of the other expert. 
you know, the, 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 the one we're talking to knows what they should be doing, but then there's this sort of slightly odd behavior from the other side. How do you deal with that? The other thing that I, I try to reassure people of in, in, in this training uh, session is that in a sense, they are not on their own in all of this, that they have the, the fullback of the solicitors to, to, to contact. Um, there are a number of avenues they can take, but their primary route really is to remember that their overriding duty is to help the court and they need to ask themselves always, actually, what would help the court in this situation? What's going to, what's going to be beneficial to the court? There was a case way back in 2012 where the, I think there were six experts at the discussion and uh, the the judge, Mr. Justice Coulson, he's a court of appeal judge now, but he uh, was a first instance judge at the time. He said, I haven't been given a joint statement. And he said, I've not been told why, because I'm not allowed to know what happens in the con in the course of the discussions, but I've not been provided with a, a joint statement. I've simply been told that the experts fell out. And he then goes on to say, well, quite frankly, experts have no business in falling out. They're there to help me. And you're there to help the, the judge by discussing the issues, seeing what you can agree, seeing what you disagree and why you disagree. It. And I think you can be quite flexible and creative about that. You might be ending up saying, well, the two of us have taken a totally different approach to this. Uh, we've taken an entirely different approach. But you could agree that if approach A is taken, then we agree that this is the outcome. And if approach B is taken, then this is the outcome. So there are always, I think, areas where the experts can agree. And I think it's about being a bit creative about where we can agree. And one of the things I emphasize is the need actually to identify agreed areas first, even if the agreement is we're here to help the court um, as the reminder. And, and knowing actually the judge is going to be looking over our shoulders wanting a joint statement, that tends to focus minds a little bit. Well, it sounds like there's there's quite a lot to get your head around as an expert witness, and it's important. And in fact, I think Sir Geoffrey Voss, the new Master of the Rolls, has indicated a, a much more important role for discussions because he really wants to narrow issues and get things moving. So it may be a good idea if any experts watching do look at that course. Well, listen, Nick, thank you so much for your time and experience. It's much appreciated. And thank you, experts, very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.